Welcome everyone to this session on protecting youth mental health. My name is Fatem Sahar Al-Azouzi and I'm a global shaper from the Casablanca Hub in Morocco. So we are here to talk about mental health for a, spe a special population, which is youth. Uh, 2019 was time to act for youth mental health and there were a lot of youth-related mental health activities and initiatives that we will talk about uh, during our discussion. But 2020 is time to invest in mental health and scale those initiatives for even more impact. And that's what we want to focus this conversa conversation on in line with the theme of this annual meeting, which is stakeholders for a sustainable and cohesive world. And specifically here, we want to talk about an emotionally co cohesive world and a mentally cohesive world. Um, so um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our panelists here with us today. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, my fellow shaper uh, from the Bangkok hub in Thailand, Amorantep Sancha Muniwong, uh, Sanju. Uh, so Sanju uh, has um, a lived experience with mental health, which led him to co-found uh, Sati app, uh, which he's going to talk to us uh, about uh, in a moment. Um, we have with us uh, Professor Jeremy Farr, uh, Executive Director of the Wellcome Trust, uh, who announced at the last Davos uh, big investment of uh, 200 million pounds uh, in mental health. So we're going to talk about that as well. Um, we also have with us uh, Director Henrietta uh, Farr from the uh, UNICEF. Um, and UNICEF uh, has uh, mental health as one of its two priorities this year. So we want to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. And we have with us uh, Professor Pat Magori uh, from uh, Origin uh, Australia. So he has um, um, been working on youth mental health specifically for uh, more than 30 years since uh, the late 80s. So it would be interesting to know about his perspective. Um, I would also uh, like to um, acknowledge one of the panelists who could not make it because she uh, was not able to get her visa. And uh, that is uh, uh, Grace Gatera, from, uh, a mental health advocate from uh, Rwanda with a lived experience, uh, specifically around uh, trauma related to genocide. So I will read to you the message that um, she would like to send. Listen to us. Invest in us. Fund us. Fund our youth-led initiatives. Invest in early intervention mental health programs, especially on a national level. Please listen. So that was Grace's uh, message. And actually, before we start uh, the, the discussion, um, um, I would like to um, I would like us in the, the middle of this busy Davos week to just take one minute to recenter since we're talking about mental health and uh, it's good to walk the talk. That's what we do as shapers. We like to um, have action. So instead of just talking, let's start with just taking one minute um, to uh, recenter. So um, if you're comfortable, you can uh, go ahead and close your eyes with me. If you're not, you can keep them open. So we will just take three deep breaths. So deep inhale. Slow exhale, deep inhale, slow exhale, deep inhale, slow exhale, and check in yourself with yourself and see how you feel right now. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So, um, Sanju, you're the representative of youth on this panel, so I would like to start with you uh, and uh, uh, your, your story with lived experience. So tell us about that and uh, how it led you to be a mental health advocate and what you did in this space, uh, especially during the past year. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, I've lived with uh, major depressive disorder and schizophrenia for the past uh, four years and started in 2015. Um, and then it went to the point where um, I was severely self-harming and having suicidal thoughts and um, hallucinating. And so by 2016, I was having up to 16 pills of antipsychotic, uh, antidepressant, Xanax, uh, and, and sleeping pills. But that wasn't enough for me to get better, so I had to go to the extreme of getting electroconvulsive therapy uh, 36 times. Um, 
it was getting better, but with all the meds that I was on, uh, my weight gained by about 50 plus kgs uh, from what it used to be. So we had to stop the ACT and start with the therapy again. Um, a lot of us live, so I live in a place where people don't really understand what mental health really is. Um, so in 2017, because I was in a place where I couldn't talk to anyone, I couldn't express myself very much, uh, I attempted suicide. Um, I came out of the hospital this time, um, and then I flew away for a while. And then when I came back, um, I was again in the same place where people didn't understand what was going on. So 2018, uh, before attempting suicide, I called the suicide hotline uh, in Bangkok, and no one picked up my call. Um, so I was put into hospital, came out, and then I was very, to put it mildly, I was very pissed off that no one picked up my call and I thought that if I, my call wasn't being answered, then how many people out there calls are not being answered? So I decided to take action into my own hand. If the system is not working, then I just decided to create my own application that provides on-demand listening services. Yeah, so well, thank you so much for vulnerably sharing that. It's, I've heard that story many times, but it's always <laughs> inspiring. Um, so what did you do after that experience? Um, so I started doing a lot of research um, into mental health, especially in Thailand. Um, we have shortages of psychiatrists. Uh, we have a very um, not affordable and not accessible mental health care in the country. Um, we have a system where people are calling into the suicide hotline. 800,000 people called in 2018, and um, about just 20% were answered uh, in 2018, and it wasn't being fixed, and it has been like that for so long. Um, so I've started a campaign last year that was picked up as a national campaign called Heart With Ears to promote empathy and deep listening and active listening. And that is also what we as shapers are doing with uh, Friendship Bench and Inuka, where we're going to train 10,000 shapers globally to become empathetic listeners and work in our own community as active listeners and pass on the, the knowledge to, to other people. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So, so this is an example of a community-based youth-led initiative to deal with youth uh, uh, mental health. Uh, I forgot to mention that this session is live streamed. So if you, if you are following us uh, online and using uh, social media, you can share using hashtag WEF20 and also using hashtag time to invest for mental health. So I'm going uh, to go uh, to you, uh, Director. And uh, so UNICEF has, been, has set mental health as uh, one of two priorities, the other one being climate change. Uh, so that's a bold uh, move. Uh, so we'd love us to tell you why you think that is important now. And you've also recently uh, organized the first uh, conference on child and adolescent uh, mental health. So you just heard the experience of um, Sanju as an individual experience, but UNICEF has maybe the farthest reach to, to youth and they're 18 and, and children. Um, so how do you um, envision leveraging that access that you have uh, for, for mental health and what kind of uh, solutions you are thinking to bring? Well, these are wonderful questions and, and they come out of these experiences. So what Grace said, um, invest in us and what you're saying. It is invest in us and in our ideas and ways that we can reach out. So for UNICEF, that's what we're hearing from lots of young people. And as you know, we work in every country in the world. So some of them are in real humanitarian disasters. So uh, that is one group of countries. There is another group that are in development. So they are at every stage, low, middle, and high income. Mm -hmm. And what strikes you is that children and young people are in need in all of these countries. It is not something that is one particular part of the world. It is not just that it's in low income countries or just in high income countries. Mm -hmm. It's ubiquitous. So we must address it. And so <clears throat> um, as we look at the world around us, what we are seeing is that about half of most of the mental health issues that come up are um, there by the time you're 14 years old, and maybe 75% by the time you're 10 years later, you're in your mid-20s. So if that's happening then, then we've got to catch it early. Yeah. So what we do with children is very important. When we're in humanitarian situations, let's say it's South Sudan, uh, we have lots of children who have been displaced by conflict. Some have become child soldiers, um, and many have been displaced from their homes. They need places of security, of being able to uh, be centered, mm -hmm. to have a chance to just think. Would they love to have somebody listen to them? They would. That is everywhere. But they just need that. 
When we go to other places, uh, we are seeing that there are different kinds of needs. And there are young people who have cell phones. So we have one system called you Report, another one that is online e-mental health. <clears throat> and this means that you can phone in, you can get someone to listen to you, uh, and you can talk about whatever problems you see. Suicide is one of the top five reasons uh, for death in the world. is very high among adolescents and young people. So the need is immense. Uh, we are seeing that the future is going to have to be composed around several themes. So that's what we're working on. One is that it's multidimensional. Mm -hmm. There's nutrition, there's um, uh, obesity is on the rise among adolescents. So we started programs for adolescents. But uh, your body image, drugs, what, what then happens when you're in these processes? Another one is breaking the silence, stopping the stigma and the discrimination. Many of the problems start in the, in the schoolyards, in bullying, in violence, and violence online now, uh, big issues. Um, we've started something that Jeremy can also talk about, in which we want to try to help national governments in tracking who in their population has mental health mm -hmm. issues so that they can see what sorts of services that become public health services should be offered to various populations in various parts of their countries. So we'll be hoping to roll that out this year. It'll be part of the national health surveys, but I think it will be a very important part. And then lastly, the initiative the Shapers have for the 10,000 Peer support is going to be very important for the future. Young people want to help other young people. It's on a wide variety of subjects. But whether you um, have just come back from being a child soldier, whether you are being reintegrated and you've been um, in Syria, you're now going back to a home that you may never have visited in, in Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan or another place, you want to talk to someone. And this is the time and the place that young people can help other young people. Thank you so much for sharing those examples. So um, we have the youth to youth supports. We have the multi-dimensional aspects. So most of the time, mental health is discussed in isolation. We feel like, OK, we have this topic for mental health. And there's a population of people who have mental illness. But it's really about every one of us. It's just it's not about whether you have uh, mental health or not. It's just, you know, it's going to happen sometime. It just depends when that, on the, when that happens. So, uh, so I think uh, this is a, a, good, a good point for you, Professor. Professor uh, Farrar to, um, to speak about that multidimensionality and um, you know the Wellcome Trust announced that um, 200 million pounds um, investment. So what, what is the approach you plan to, to take um, compared to this um, states we have right now today? Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, I, it's great to have had the words from Rwanda. I'm sorry she couldn't come and, and personal experience because because if we don't put those voices at the heart of this, then we won't we won't make the progress. And 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 Henrietta said it, and, and we would all say it that, that we're not starting from scratch. We'll hear in a, in a minute there has been progress, but there has not been as much progress in this space as there has been in others. Um, you know, I come from an infectious disease background, but but there has not been as much progress in the area of mental health over the last 20, 30, 40, 40 years. And that's, that's a scientific problem, it's a societal problem, it's an innovation problem, it's a funding problem, but it's also a problem within all of us, because I doubt if there's anybody in this room, I doubt if there's many people here at Davos this week who don't have some sort of personal experience of this, whether it's them themselves, mm -hmm. bravely sharing their stories with us, or brothers, cousins, nephews, nieces, whatever it is, it will affect all of us. I think that's our great opportunity because it is not about something happening to people far away. Yeah. This is something happening to all of us. And if, and if we could go forward by building a movement, and we're going to focus on young people's mental health, as you know, by building a movement that actually isn't about a research funding agency or an esoteric piece of research, but which actually is owned by the community who are driving it and, and are affected by it mostly, then I think we would learn lessons from the movements of the last 20, 30 years that have really progressed. And of course, we all think of, of what happened in HIV and the progress that was made very quickly there. So I think our role, um, and Welcome is um, absolutely committed to this, it's not just a five year play, this will be our our focus area along with climate change and infections over the next 10 20 years so yeah we've put 200 million to it we announced that last year but that is nowhere near enough 
and, and again, learning lessons, and there's some colleagues here have been very involved in this. Um, what we need to try and do is say we will do that, but that is a, a drop in the ocean unless we're able to bring lots of other people with us mm. to magnify that, to leverage it, to access new capital that we've not previously accessed, whether from industry or whether in, in ways of innovative fun, uh, financing. Victor Zaus there is leading a, a charge on bringing innovative financing into this. And lastly, I'd say that we, we absolutely need to break down the, the silos that the research community has built up over the last 20 or 30 years. Mm. Um, I trained originally as a neurologist. You have neurologists, you have psychiatrists, you have people working on neuroscience and basic mechanisms of disease. That community has got to be brought together. At the moment, I'm not saying they fight each other, but at the moment they're fragmented in silos. Mm. And this is an area that's been uh, not had enough funding. And generally when that happens, people go more into their silos, not lot less. Um, the analogy somebody uh, gave to me is if you work on basic science, if you work on terminal care, if you work in a hospital or a hospice or you're giving advice to people in cancer, you all are proud to say I work in cancer. We don't have that in the mental health yes. arena. Um, the psychiatrists talk often one language, the people with lived experience talk another, people in neuroscience talk another, biologists talk another. We've got to try and bring these together and say there is an opportunity for all of you here and you'll be better if we work together than if we worked apart. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So that's the multidimensionality that we were talking about at a different level among professionals actually in the field. And thank you for sharing that. I am proud to work in mental health, which would be, would be something that we would love to hear. Uh, so you touched upon also the importance of having a movement. Uh, and um, just um, in line with that, I would like to share that there is currently a global mental health campaign called Speak Your Mind. So this is the first uh, locally started and globally united uh, mental health campaign. Um, so if you want to contribute, you can go to gospeakyourmind.org. Um, and one way that you can help share the message is, um, as you may know, every 40 seconds, someone um, in the world dies by suicide. Uh, so you can uh, share a 40 second video uh, talking about the importance of, uh, of this message. So, uh, Professor McGorry, um, you know, as I said, you know, since the, the, the end of the 80s, you've been working on youth mental health. So, you probably have, some, have learned something that you want to share with us. So, we'd love to know uh, what is it that you learned? What do you think are uh, the, the messages we need to stick, stick to, the approaches, and so on? Um, and, you know, talk to us about, um, you know, origin and what it's been doing recently in that space. Thank you, Fatima. Well. <coughs> well, I think we've, you've heard some of the messages already. Yeah. It, mental health used to be an us and them issue. As Jeremy just said, it's an us issue. It's all of us. And uh, that's, that's a big breakthrough, I think. And uh, we're feeling it in the room today, aren't we? So that's one of the big things. And because we're focusing on young people, um, early intervention, as Henrietta said, is absolutely the key. And you could, you could almost say that mental, mental illness is the number one uh, health issue facing the world, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a health sense. And I think the Economic Forum, World Economic Forum, helped to put it there because their report from 2011 showed the massive impact on society of, of um, mental illness. And, and, and we're realising now why that is, because it strikes early in the lifespan, as Henrietta said, 75% by 25. And, yeah. and the, adult, the disorders that impact on adult life and, and sap, sap the futures of people. And, and uh, it, it's uh, premature death, it's, um, but it's lost potential as well, undermining the, 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 I don't know, the energy of society. Um, that's something that, you know, if we tackle that and make that the number one priority, which Welcome has, has actually put it front and centre, which is great, as Jeremy just said, that's very, very important. I started off working in the old mental hospital systems in, in the 1980s when um, these terrified young people would be coming into hospital with their first psychotic episode and they'd often be, have, would have been ill for a couple of years. They'd be treated as if they, they were in their 15th episode of schizophrenia, no hope. You know, it was the only specialty in medicine which would extract hope from the patient at the first presentation. You're not going to get better. You know, you won't have a normal life. All of those messages were given by psychiatry, traditional psychiatry, to, to the patients. It's nonsense, you know. I mean, it's, and we, we've been able to show, first of all, with the psychosis, we could change the early course of these illnesses, even by deploying existing treatments much more carefully in a holistic way, looking at the whole person, not just the medication and, and the custodial aspects. That, that has was the first wave of reform from my perspective which swept around the world with early intervention for psychosis and that is a very you know, major step forward which still is not available to most people with, with psychotic disorders around the world, even in high, high income countries. 
but we could see a bigger picture issue then, that, that, that the epidemiology of mental illness was such that if you wanted to change the course and, and, uh, and, and affect the, the long-term outcome, you had to look at the transdiagnostically, as Jeremy was alluding to. These, these disorders do not fit neatly into, into categories in a DSM or an ICD. They evolve, and we've seen this with Headspace now in Australia. Yes. We've developed a primary care system in the last 15 years which has spanned the whole country. We have 105 integrated youth health platforms across the country. Federal governments, successive federal governments have supported this very, very strongly. Mm. It's been um, designed by local communities, coming back to Sanju's point, um, and by young people, co-designed by them. So it feels like a safe, trusted space and brand for young people. And about 15 other countries have, have embraced this model too now. So this is a very, very hopeful sign. Mm. It's not just about the treatments, it's about the culture of care and delivering a health system that delivers what is already known, not just new discoveries, but actually, you know, the, it's only a very small minority of people that get access to what we can already do in terms of helping them. And if you do that, you see recoveries every single day. You know, I, I see that. That's why I'm still optimistic, very optimistic. And I think we're on the cusp, actually. Um, the fact that we're here today discussing it really indicates that. And so I'm very, very inspired. So great to be yeah, here. Yeah, thank you for sharing that message uh, of, of hope, because I think we all need this. There might be people watching us who are dealing with uh, mental illness or mental health issues. So we want to say that it is possible to solve this. Now, how do we do this? Nobody can do that alone. So we need a multi-stakeholder approach. And I'd like to invite all of you, anyone who wants to share, who do we need? Who are the stakeholders we need to be part of that discussion? Because today there might be some stakeholders who are already involved, but maybe some are not, are, are missing. So who are those people so that we make a call to action to them today. Sandra, you want to um, share? So I think we, we, of course, we need to have the youth uh, at the table because they're they are right now the one who is uh, going through uh, mental health uh, the most um, globally. Um, I think we, we there's also a need for the government uh, for private sector to come in because um, the report came out from SAP in the United States that 50% uh, of millennials and 75% of Gen Z uh, leaving uh, the workspace because of burnout, and, and we need to uh, fix that. Mm -hmm. And one, one stakeholder that I don't really think people talk about is the media, um, because media can be the the force to create weather effect, uh, weather effect, which is copycat suicide. So for example, in, in Thailand, there's no proper media literacy on how to uh, talk about suicide or, or mental health. And sometimes they share too much uh, through the news where the next four suicide that happened, happened the same way that happened uh, with that. So I think one very important uh, group that we need to bring in is, is uh, the media. Yeah, to talk about mental health in, in the right way. Okay, so, so youth as a stakeholder, very important to have a seat at the table and be part of the conversation and design in any systems. Yeah, and it, um, yes, go ahead. And it's also the way media uses languages, right? Because languages for mental health is very different uh, in every part of the world. Mm -hmm. So for example, the word psychosis uh, in Thai language is rokjit, uh, but media, Try to use tends to use the word rokjit as to mean pervert, you know, and and then there was uh, also another mental activist who also took antidepressant and she also gained a lot of weight, and the media wrote that uh, this person took so much weight that she now looks like a bullfrog, but she's still uh, pushing on mental health. So these are the sort of like stigma that that should really be eradicated from, from the media and it should be put in a more light that empower youth living with mental health to, to just speak out about, about what issues that they're having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. so media as a stakeholder and definitely being culturally aware yeah. because there is no one size fits all in this uh, discussion and nobody I think has it figured out today how to solve this. So um, it's important to, to, you know, to have global solutions but make sure that they are tailored to the environment, especially you know, if we talk about, for example, conflict zones. Uh, you know, there are populations that have specific needs. So um, I'd like to take it to um, uh, inclusion. Um, so specific populations, as I said, you know, in conflict zones, uh, maybe gender-based violence, um, people with disabilities, uh, refugees. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if you if you want to share anything around the specific needs of those populations and how what, when designing global mental health systems, we don't forget about those and make sure that we tailor it to their needs. Would you like to share something like um, that? Yes, you are absolutely right. They are harrowing stories and they are the sort that make you realize that as a world, we must do better about being humane, that our humanity makes a difference. So. When I was in Cox's Bazaar, many of the um, Rohingyas that have fled there have 
uh, witnessed violence to a level that they had never witnessed it before. So whether it was children or whether it was women. And it was um, that they would see their mother being killed or their sister or that they would be defiled in public. Uh, so these images, these images of horror were, were carried with them. We began putting them into safe spaces um, to place them in a place where they could talk to other children and that they could draw pictures. It's a way to bring out some of these feelings. But there is a need in any of these times for just a person to feel safe. And for children, it's extremely important. And when you um, are in many of these refugee situations, sometimes you lose your family. It is frightening if you are six years old and you have lost your family. And when you are the humanitarian workers, it is just as much of a mental health problem that you can't find their family. And you, I mean, they're just crying their heart out. So it is both what children see, what they experience. It's that time of quiet. It is what you then do to bring them back. The socialization in a school can make a big difference. So there can be a social cohesion and a healing in the school. So one of the groups that you mentioned, who's missing? Sometimes we forget about best friends. But if you have a friend who actually says, how are you, and they care about you, and they know when you're not talking up, when you look anxious, depressed, that's the beginning of getting help. And that's what these children need in some of the worst situations. Yeah, I love that. Best friends as a stakeholder. What if, would, if yeah. To add to that, I actually had two friends. Um, if I called them at 2 a.m. Or, or something, having a panic attack in the car, they would actually come out and, and help. Uh, take care of me and everything. So I totally echo that, that, you know, best friends are someone who is really important for you as well. Yes, perfect. Yeah, and, and also, um, I think um, in relation also to the education system or schools as a stakeholder, the emotional literacy, because many of us, I, I hear most of the time, I have a friend who's struggling, but I don't know how to help. So I think this needs to be part of the discussion, emotional literacy, realizing when we're dealing with depression or burnout or anxiety, and knowing what tools to use. Uh, would you like to t talk about the, um, the empathic listening and the yeah, papers? So um, we, we believe that you know, everyone has the power to be empathetic. I think it's in us to be empathetic. It's just that we have forgotten how to be one. And a lot of time we sort of confuse sympathy with empathy. Um, and so what us shapers are trying to do is basically the first line of defense for someone who is about to go into a crisis of mental health breakdown or burnout breakdown is basically to have someone listen to them and listen to them without judgment and listen to them without telling them what they need to do and just listen. because. Like you said, art pieces and whatnot is very important. It's just a way for us to express, you know, either through art, to, through cooking, through talking, you know, and just to have that is very important. And that's why um, us shapers um, are working with uh, the Friendship Bench uh, by Dr. Dixon and uh, Inuka uh, to train. Right now we are doing a um, pilot uh, project with 15 shapers from 15 cities uh, around the world, and then we hope to slowly uh, like expand it to all of our shapers community. And because for us shapers, as, as you know, we are, we, we are considered as high achievers because we are not just doing our main job, but at the same time, we are volunteering our time to make the world a better place. And there's a lot of tasking uh, things that goes on with us. And sometimes for us just to have a shaper friend who understand the, the immense pressure that we are going on is also very important. So this is going to create that um, a strong bond and peer-to-peer -peer, um, sort of helping one another out. Yeah, active, activism burnout is very important, especially in this culture of young people of, you know, I, I'm not in the Forbes 30 under 30 list, so I haven't done anything in my life. So uh, I think it's important to, to address that. Yes, Professor Farrell, you had a comment. Yeah, I, I think um, rather than asking who should be in the tent, I, I think the sort of it's better to ask. There's no reason why anybody should be outside the tent. I okay, mean, yeah. if you're going to create a movement, this can't be about us and them, as you said earlier. Um, it's got to come from those people with lived experience, um, and it's got to bring mind everybody in. If you know, if there's one thing that WEF well, does, many things, but if one thing does WEF does, it, it brings together the whole community. Um, you can't deal with this unless we also talk about the workplace. Um, you can't deal with this unless companies engage on it, and not just the pharma companies who may be 
produce products, but everybody, including us as an employer, because that workplace mental health is an issue. Uh, it's an issue of health, of course, and well-being, but it's also critically an issue of economic productivity. So this is something that has to bind everybody together. And we all agree that there's no single magic bullet here. It's a holistic approach and it has to be integrated. Absolutely, we're all bought into that. But that's not the same as saying there isn't accountability. Mm -hmm. and, and again, the thing at WEF is you come, you have the debates, you have the discussion, and there are people who can make decisions here and there are people who have great influence. But you, when you've gone, you've got to go away and commit to achieve delivering what you promised when you were here. Because mm -hmm. otherwise there's no point coming. And so that's something that's gone through last year. We did this with CEPI many years ago. And we, we come here, we debate, we discuss, we all agree in the main, we've got to go away. And those of us who are in positions of authority and, and leadership have then got to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, the thing that Richard Edelman, who's sitting over there, talks about, about trust and accountability is lost. Mm -hmm. So that's the pressure, I think, that comes back to everybody that's mm -hmm. here saying the right things to make it happen when we leave here. Yeah, so those stakeholders that we need to bring in to make them accountable, I know that Wellcome Trust is not working um, in isolation on, on the five-year program. So um, I suppose you already have some stakeholders that you're working with. Do you think there are any missing that maybe for some reason you couldn't reach or who are not part of the discussion and you'd like yeah. to... And, and you, you, right you, you honestly, you, you don't miss people because you don't want them. Right. Um, and, and one of the reasons for having this session is, is to actually reach out and say now, with the connectivity we have, mm. please reach out to us. And it doesn't have to be to us. It could be to Henrietta. It could be to the Shapers. Yeah. It could be anybody in this room. But, but if you don't bind everybody and keep everybody on the tent, in the tent or on the bus, whichever acronym you want, um, then we will only address a little part of it. Mm -hmm. And that is not that won't move the field forward. Mm -hmm. Fatima, could I just jump in there? Of course, yes. Um, because I've struggled with this in the last 10 years in Australia as well, because um, we have had a lot of awareness. We've had ma massive awareness, actually, of mental Ill health and Ill mental illness in Australia. So every, every Australian would, would be able to talk more freely now than they could have 10 or 15 years ago. But it's been, it's actually caused uh, stagnation of, of action in, in, in some ways, because people think by talking about it, something's being done. You know? yeah. And actually, what Jeremy just said is very, very important. There's a real call to action here, not just from the private sector, from World Economic Forum world, which is fantastic. The corporate world is getting engaged with this finally. I'd say it's been very late in the piece, I must say. But World Economic Forum has played a good role here. But government, government is off the hook yes. in many ways. And um, even when we have sympathetic uh, ministers and, and prime ministers, we've had about five very sympathetic prime ministers for mental health in Australia. We have had this progress, mm. especially in youth mental health. That's been great progress. But you know, the fact is, we don't have parity. You know, we do not have parity. If you have a mental health problem, you do not the same. You do not get the same access or quality of care, even in rich countries. And that's a fact all around the world. And we have the high-income countries have got you know a lot of neglect. So how is that going to change? It has to be driven by the public, by, by the, the voters, actually, the voters. And, and so campaigns are developing, United for Global Mental Health, in, based in the UK. In Australia, we have Australians for Mental Health. This is a new grassroots movement giving a voice to every single member of the public. Mm. That's the goal, because every single member of the public is affected. But if they don't actually indicate that they care about it to the political world, we're not going to see government investment. That, that's the missing ingredient, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the grand public and voters specifically as, as a stakeholder, I guess, if we, if we can call it that way. So would you like to touch upon the, why do you think um, it was a successful experience in Australia to have the, the political uh, support of uh, federal governments? Well, you know, but, but, you know, for, how can we replicate this in other countries? Well, it's very interesting because I tried for a long time, the first part of my career, to get governments to invest in schizophrenia and psychosis and serious mental illness, which is obviously still pretty neglected. But what really worked was a focus on young people because everybody can relate to their kids, you know. And we're talking mainly about 12 to 25, teenagers, young adults, on the threshold of adult life. Um, and that's where parents really start to get concerned and they see the reality of mental ill health. Mm -hmm. there, sure, there are, little, there, are, there are mental health problems in little kids, and, and you mentioned all the risk factors that are operating in the younger children, but the real rubber hits the road in once you hit puberty and, and into that sort of uh, transition to adulthood. And, and the public care about that. Everyone, we all in the room, we care about that. Politicians care about it. They know it's a reality. So that was successful in mobilising, you know, so, so in a way, youth mental health was the vanguard for investment. It's happening in other countries too. I mentioned 12 or 15 other countries are starting to get this. 
Mm -hmm. Wellcome Trust has, has actually embraced that very, very strongly, great leadership. So, so I think this is really starting to be a success story and hopefully the rest of mental health care can, can follow. You create some optimism and success and, and, you, and you get a belief that, that you can make a difference to people's lives. That's what they do in cancer, even though it's, it's not, not as successful as you might think. Yeah. You know? yeah. But um, the hope and, and that prospect of success is a very, a very important message for us. Yes. It's really important. I mean, a lot of people, the analogy to cancer, I think, are, are important. And, and, you know, I've, I've witnessed going through and people have, have they've had moonshots in cancer. Even, even Richard Nixon had a moonshot in cancer. And people deride that and say, but actually, I would argue the opposite. It, it gives a sense of hope and it gives a sense of energy that actually you can make a difference. And one of the problems that I think is bedevilous is we've all been frightened of it. We don't know how to react when our relative, brother, friend, whatever it is. And, and that makes us fearful. Mm -hmm. And when we're fearful, we step back away from it, unless you've got very good friends at 2 a.m. Like, like you have. Um, so we have to offer realistic, honest hope that you can actually change something. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we've had that in this field no. uh, until recently. Yeah, I agree. Could I add to that Of one? course, yes. So when we're talking to young people around the world, one of the areas for their anxiety is that they don't feel they're getting an education that's modern and that they're not going to get a job. So it's creating a lot of stress and a lot of depression because they just feel they're going to be locked out. So the World Economic Forum has taken this on about jobs, very important. Another one is on climate. They worry about the world that we are going to be leaving, that they are um, now in. So if we can solve some of these issues, it will help with mental health. So Jeremy's point about standing up a movement is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. We have to realize that we're all in it, but we have to be willing to say proudly that we're in it for a movement for mental health, that this is important to all of us. And there are lots of feeders into it, and we can get to some of the root causes together, but we have to solve this. Yes, definitely. So again, the idea of a holistic approach, mental health does not stand in isolation, but in relation to education and climate change, among uh, other topics. Um, so um, we need to start wrapping up here. And I would like to ask each one of you um, a question to make this tangible for, for the audience. So uh, today, what, uh, what can anyone do to progress youth mental health? And maybe you can talk to just the public about anyone. If you want to talk to government specifically, to so industry, we didn't talk so, too much about the private sector and what they can contribute uh, if you know, each one of you can have an actionable item what can I do today to um, I think to what we all actually can do in this room is to just ask ourselves am I a, am I a good listener you know once we ask ourselves am I a good listener and if you think you are not then maybe reach out to someone or some foundation that can educate you on deep listening and active listening mm -hmm. to just make yourself become an empathetic listener and I think that's just the basic question to ask yourself Go next? Uh, going back to this issue of accountability, um, it is all of us. It's not going to get done by somebody else. Um, so if you're sitting in this room now, email me in the next few days and join that engagement. Um, we would love to have people engaged with this. Um, my email is available somewhere. Um, email us and get involved because you'll make a difference. Okay, if I might touch upon that as I give my own call to action, I wasn't planning to do that, but it, it links to, to your idea. Um, uh, next month, the World Economic Forum will be launched in Uplink, which is the digital platform for collaboration among different stakeholders, so anyone can join and contribute. So this could be an easy way to bring together the public, the governments, the pri private sector, all the stakeholders who need to be part of the conversation. Uh, Dark Sir, you want to share? Uh, well, break the silence is one of the most important things we could do for this generation now and uh, end the stigma mm -hmm. and invest yourself. Do something about it. Roll up our sleeves. Let's get to work. Mm. Thank you. Well, I'd like I, I, I learned something from listening to Jeremy and Henrietta that, about the need for confidence, you know. I mean, in psychiatry, when I, when I, when I trained in psychiatry, I, I did general medicine first and then I moved to psychiatry, I had people queuing up trying to talk me out of that career move, you know. <laughs> Don't waste your life on, quote, unquote, those people. <laughs> now, that is a disgrace, you know. And, and that attitude, that lack of confidence, you, know, you said, let's, let's be proud of, of this mission that we are, we're all hoping, hoping to be committed to. So more, more confidence, more 
um, ambition and uh, it, it's got to be a, a, a community-wide effort as Jeremy and, and Henrietta and, and Sanju have been saying so I think I think we can do it you know it's, it's not a moonshot it's achievable yeah. Yeah, so, you know, to wrap up and then on this um, positive message of hope, uh, so we know we can achieve this. Uh, there has been some progress made, but definitely there's a lot more to be done. Uh, keep in mind this holistic approach that mental health does not stand in isolation. Again, everybody needs to be part of the conversation because nobody needs to be outside this circle of uh, stakeholders and holding those stakeholders accountable in, or in order to reach actual impacts and not keep it just at the, uh, at the talking stage. Uh, uh, remembering the message of inclusion as well, so caring for those vulnerable and underrepresented uh, populations. And stigma, of course, this effort needs to continue uh, you know, in parallel with um, investing in, in mental health. And um, I would like actually to invite you all to watch a video on that, how to break the stigma, and it's uh, for the Speak Your Mind campaign. Hong Kong, Colombia, Canada, South Africa, England. Every 40 seconds, someone dies by suicide. Every time someone dies by suicide, you lose all the brilliance they could have brought into the world. I personally have struggled with anxiety my whole life. We need mental health to be taken as seriously as physical health. I'm calling on my leaders to act on mental health because people in Pakistan and all over the world deserve better. For too long, there's been stigma attached to talking about mental health and well-being. Mental health has been neglected for too long. It concerns us all, and greater action is urgent. The world is speaking. We have the blueprint of what works. It's time to invest in mental health. It is indeed time to invest, and we hope that you all will contribute to 2020 being the year for investments in mental health. And you have a clear call to action here, so you can contribute by participating in the campaign. I would like to thank all the panelists. That was a delightful discussion that we've had, and this message of hope, again, that we're giving to anyone who might be struggling. Thank you all. Thank you.